We're so happy that you can join us for this keynote discussion with famed civil rights lawyer, John Morris. My name is Terrence Evans. I'm a partner at Dwayne Morris. I am also the chair of the litigation section of the California Lawyers Association, co-chair and co-founder of the California Lawyers Association Racial Justice Committee, vice president of Charles Houston and deputy director of Region 9 of the National Bar Association. Thank you again, everybody, for being part of this discussion. For those of you who may not know John Burris, uh, he is by far one of the most renowned civil rights lawyers in California. And before we begin our discussion, I'm just gonna give a, a brief overview of his amazing career. John has been a civil rights lawyer for over 40 years. He's represented over 1,000 victims of police misconduct and thousands more in class action lawsuits, employment lawsuits, and court cases. He has advised and represented defendants in serious criminal cases. His clients have included a wide range of high profile public figures and professional athletes. His police cases include, but are not limited to, Rodney King, rapper Tupac Shakur, singer, Dwayne Wiggins and 119 plaintiffs against the city of Oakland and the writer's police abuse case, which resulted in serious reforms and independent monitor appointed for the city. He's also represented over 100 victims uh, in illegal search and warrant cases, as well as over 40 African Americans who were subjected to unconstitutional public strip searches. In San Jose, John Burris represented Pung Lam, an excessive force shooting victim who was awarded the largest amount of damages ever assessed against the city, $11.3 million. John represented Jasmine Absalom, the victim who was at the center of the recent Oakland Police Department sexual exploitation scandal. And he represented Mandy Kane Jr. in the case Walking While Black against the city of Sacramento, which resulted in a series of changes in police procedures. When Oscar Grant, who was killed by a BART police officer upon which the award-winning film Fruitville Station is based, John represented Oscar's family. Teresa, Teresa Sheehan, who was shot by San Francisco police, was represented uh, by John. Sheehan's case was heard before the Ninth Circuit, Court of Appeals, and the United States Supreme Court. True to his character, he represented the homeless woman who was beaten by a CHP officer on the freeway in Los Angeles and he represented over 20 Southeast Asian women who were sexually harassed by an Oakland police officer. Recently in 2019, John settled several high profile police misconduct cases for more than a million dollars plus each. In Sacramento, he represented John Hernandez against the Sacramento Police Department for its officers use of excessive force, which included taser and bas uh, baton strikes leaving Hernandez with permanent brain damage. And he also was involved in the uh, McIntree versus Sacramento County matter. He represented the plaintiff's family who was accused of wrongful death uh, for killing of a mentally impaired man who was shot while running away from police after striking an officer with a rock. In Oakland, he represented a homeless man who was wrongfully killed by the Oakland police uh, finally, in 2020, John was awarded a jury verdict against BART police in a wrongful shooting death uh, where an officer shot a man who was wrestling over a gun with another man. John's effective counsel in a variety of cases has been and continues to be known throughout the nation. Uh, he's represented in jury trials professional athletes such as Gary Payton, Keyshawn Johnson, and Michael Bennett. He has been counsel for baseball great Barry Bonds, professional basketball players Jalen Brown, Jason Kidd, Latrell Spewell, Kevin Durant. He's represented well-known baseball sports agents, 
Aaron and Eric Goodwin. He's represented former San Francisco police chief Earl Sanders when the San Francisco grand jury indicted the entire police department's command staff. He's been plaintiff's counsel in several major employment cases, including several cases against the California Department of Corrections related to inmates exhibition where injunctive relief was granted after a jury verdict in one of the cases. He was on the trial team in two major class action cases involving two major trucking companies. As a result of his amazing community award, he has received numerous recognitions for his contributions, uh, including outstanding civil rights trial attorney, outstanding trial lawyer. Uh, he's been inducted into the Trial Lawyer Hall of Fame. He was recently honored by the National Bar Association, where he was also inducted into their Hall of Fame for his civil rights work. Um, he has represented the NAACP uh, in cases uh, involving a wide range of civil rights issues. He is a founding board member of the National Lawyers Guild. He's also a founding um, member of the California Association of Black Lawyers. He was its president. He was also a past president of the Charles Houston Bar Association. He is a member of Alpha Gamma uh, Bow and Sigma Phi uh, Fraternity, uh, Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity, 100 Black Men of the Bay Area. We're going to begin, John, and I went through that very detailed resume because I just think it's important for people who are, are watching um, this interview to just have a sense of the wide range of your contributions to both civil and criminal litigation, civil rights work. Um, but if we start at the very beginning, I know that you were born in the Bay Area, and many of the discussions that I've seen you involved with haven't discussed your, your childhood. And I think it would be great for the audience to get a better sense of uh, your upbringing and what that was like uh, in the Bay Area. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, you know, I haven't talked much about my childhood because it was such a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but, it, but it had shaped me, no question about it. I worked I'm from a working class uh, government-based family. I worked uh, all through, I'm from Vallejo. I worked uh, um, uh, uh, in all kinds of jobs as a kid. I worked in the fields. Um, you know, my family were transplanted uh, from Oklahoma. Uh, I was born in California, but they were Oklahomans by nature. And so I um, developed a lot of my values from them. My family, mother and father, hardworking people. And we, uh, they taught us the value of not only hard work, but also seeing the world uh, in, large, in, in terms larger than yourself. My mother and father each worked uh, extensively with other people, uh, helping other folks providing opportunities for them through jobs and careers because my mother ultimately had a business. My dad always had small businesses, but they were very important uh, in terms of providing opportunities for others. And that sort of stuck with me. I'm a child of the civil rights movement that I could see the civil rights movement unfolding in front of me. Uh, I heard all the speeches, uh, I should say many of them of Dr. Martin Luther King uh, and, and others like Stokely Carmichael and John Lewis. Um, and I know that period uh, very well, and it had a major impact on me. I remember seeing uh, uh, the marches that took place and the impact that it was having. But the thing that stuck out the most for me was the dogs and that the police uh, who were supposed to protect people were using the dogs against people who were trying to have their own civil rights and who were protect protesting peacefully. So that had an, an impact on me how the police can be used uh, to abuse people and promoting a particular social uh, philosophy uh, of, uh, of, a, of, a, of the segment of the population. In that case, it was the, the, the segregationists that were trying to keep their life the way they knew it from integrating with the African-American communities who were in a much more disadvantaged economic status than they were. And, and so that impacted me and I never forgot it. And so uh, even though I was a teenager listening to all of these, I was growing up watching this, I was impacted by it and it undoubtedly had a major impact on, on my life as I went, went forward. I know throughout your life you devoted yourself to representing uh, victims of police brutality, police misconduct. 
but have you ever personally, as a black man, experienced any negative interactions with the police? Uh, other than as a kid, you know, you have the police chasing you for these things, you know, stealing peaches and fruit and stuff like that. But my only really uh, major situation that came about to me that was kind of frightening, um, and that was um, I had been involved in a case uh, in Alameda County, a juvenile, major juvenile case where a young man was accused of a serious crime. I'm coming home, I'm driving, I, I'd say pretty fast, like daydreaming. So I get stopped by the CHP and I'm trying to explain and reach my, my, um, my uh, ID. He immediately grabbed the door and began and, and reached for me like he was grabbing me out. And for a moment, I was truly worried about my safety. I had to think pretty quickly. Uh, because, you know, during that period of time, you know, you didn't know what would happen to you. So I immediately told him that he had hold it, hold it. I'm a lawyer. I'm just reaching for my bag. He immediately backed up. But that was, I had that fleeting moment of uncertainty about what this officer could do. Now, later on, I had police officers. I became more actively involved in civil rights, put markings on my car. We know who you are. We know where you're going. So those things. But nothing, nothing of a significance at all compared to the cases I have been involved in. And, and, but I have great empathy for what has happened to people, particularly African American men, who get the big issue for me is not aside from the death case, and we can talk about that later, but the racial profiling type cases, because I think it is potentially harmful to a person to get stopped for no reason, ask questions about why you're being stopped, the officer not responding in a positive way, and they handcuff you, and and ultimately because they don't like your attitude, you wind up getting arrested. And the collateral damage that comes from that is significant. And, and so I've always been mindful that you can ruin a person's career and their lives by a very minor event that turns into an arrest situation and affect that person's life forever. And so that's part of my big issue when I'm talking about racial profiling. I understand the danger that comes from that. Even though it might appear to be minor, you get stopped, you get your, you, you know, you, you get out of your car, put your hands up on the, on the, on the hood, and they search your car, you may not think that's a big deal. You may not, but it is an infringement upon your constitutional rights and your dignity as a human being. And I've been very much offended by that to the years. And so I've done a lot of cases uh, that refer to 140, 243 cases where a person is resisting arrest, arguably, or interfering, or, and ultimately gets arrested for that and assault on police officers. But ultimately, those card charges, I refer to them as contempt of cop cases, and, and in, in point of fact, there was no other underlying offense that was taking place. So I'm very much uh, uh, into those cases. I've been very hard on them. I've had discussions with various DAs when Kamala Harris, Kamala Harris was a DA in Alameda in San Francisco and, and others with uh, DAs. I talked to them about being careful about prosecuting people for these kind of 148s, 243s that the police have trumped up and there's no other underlying offense. So those, those are, that's an area that has always been significant to me because I've seen how people's lives get ruined and sometimes they get beat up in that process. And you, know, you kind of wonder, you know, what caused this to occur? Generally, it's, it's a bad attitude on part of the police officer. So I'm very much mindful of that kind of interaction that uh, although it did not happen to me in any significant way, the potential was there, but more importantly, it was my empathy for others was happened to and my appreciation for what could happen to you uh, and what did happen to people as a consequence of those, those interactions that's, that start out as very insignificant, but wind up where a person's life uh, is lost and or they're in custody in jail and they want to know what the hell did I do? And generally they hadn't done anything other than and try to seek and get some advice as to the, uh, their constitutional rights. You know, before we delve into some of the specific cases, a lot of the big cases you've been involved in, um, uh, this conversation reminds me of the talk that a lot of uh, African-American parents have with their kids, their sons in particular. Uh, I personally have been stopped by the police several times, including at the courthouse. Uh, I had an incident where cops didn't believe I was a real lawyer and I was detained. Uh, I've been stopped driving while black. Uh, cops asking me, how did I afford the car that I was driving? And I had a particularly scary incident in a coffee shop where I ended up surrounded by 12 cops and four had guns pointed at my head. I was afraid I was gonna be shot to death right there in the coffee shop. What advice do you have? And I know many other black men, black lawyers, even black judges who've had you know, interactions where their life 
uh, could have been taken by law enforcement. What advice do you have for black men who have interactions with the cops? What should we do to stay alive? How do we get through that situation uh, so that we don't end up being a statistic? Uh, if there are any thoughts you can share on that. Well, the first thing you do have to stay calm. Uh, stay calm, keep your wits about you, I always say, and, and try to figure out what do you need to do in order to get through the situation. That, that doesn't mean you're confrontational. Uh, it just means that you are being polite and professional as much as you can be. So I'm a firm believer, you know, you, know, you keep your, first off, you got to keep your hands where they can be seen at all times. Police officers are um, very much uh, concerned about a person's hands. I said, obviously, there's a racial component to black men and black hands. And, and so those kind of movement of your hands can get you shot uh, or killed. And if you're in a car, don't reach for anything without announcing what you're trying to do. If you cut your, your ID is in your glove compartment or it's in your, like me in my briefcase in the back seat, you tell them. Uh, you, you tell them where it is. But you keep your hands where they can be seen. You keep your voice uh, calm. And ultimately, if they want to search, you say, no, I don't give permission to search my car. They may do it anyway. But that means that you need to get the, the, uh, the ID from the officer and a badge number, the badge name and the number as best you can. And remember where you are and the circumstances in which you are. But the big thing is keep them calm and don't try to uh, aggravate the officers. But they, and this can be serious when they have guns on you. If you were situated, they, they'll put guns on you. Part of one of our big fights in some of these cases is putting guns on people when you don't have to put guns on them. But the big, big thing is, is, to me, wherever you are, the aggressive, the, the talk. I've given that talk uh, countless times, certainly to my boys and my grandkids. And I remember when, my son, when I first started doing this work many years ago, my son was getting ready to go to college. I told him he had to leave town and he can't come back <laughs> while, <laughs> while we're doing this work. And he never has come back. And he's you know, a solid citizen and all that. But I'd had real worry. Uh, for, for him. And, and so I'm very much mindful that you have to protect yourself by, by not physically being aggressive, but by staying calm, being cooperative, keeping um, um, understanding where you are and keeping notes and stuff like that about it. And then if it's bad, then you obviously have something to talk about. But the big thing is to stay safe. Um, and, and if you're on any kind of probation, or parole, you are definitely vulnerable. You know, part of what we've been trying to get done in some cases that just because you're on probation and you have a, full, a search clause, that doesn't mean you get to search the person just because you want to. The law does provide for it. And so that's the thing that you have to fight for. I was in a, in a case very recently for a young kid in one of my police cases, that a juvenile case. At the end of the case, the judge was, now he is getting ready to get uh, deferred prosecution. He's not going to be prosecuted. But the police wanted and the judge agreed to get a four-way search clause on this kid uh, for the next year. I was furious about this because I understand that search clause is a way, a form of allowing police officers to harass you because a four-way search clause means you can be stopped at any point in time, wherever you are, your car can be searched at any point in time and your house can be searched at any point in time. Well, that's a recipe for harassment and, and that's a big, big deal and a lot of kids that go, that's why I worry about when you when you go into the criminal justice system on any kind of matter, once you get in and they put these search clauses on it, on you, then you are vulnerable to any of the police officers in that community or anybody else. So these are challenging issues that I've been very much uh, focused in for a long time. And these are not the kind of issues you're reading about in the newspaper. They're not, because people don't care about that. But these are the small kinds of constitutional infringements that African-Americans face every day that including not only you get stopped, you don't have your license or something, and your car gets towed, and your car is towed, it's gonna to cost you more money to get the car than the car is worth, and you lose your job in the process of it. These are the subtle kinds of things that happen in policing that can ruin a person's life and make their life difficult. And the police have total control over this. So we're, we're and those are fights that, that I've been in, in, in the middle of, and it's always about what happens to everyday people. The, uh... The, the incident that you were just talking about uh, kind of made me think about the over-policing of Black communities, uh, and there have been a number of uh, recent books on it. Just in your experience, uh, have you seen that there has been uh, over-policing of communities of color? And in addition to that, uh, have you witnessed any systematic racism in the way 
uh, black defendants or defendants of color are treated by the criminal justice system? <laughs> well, that's a very uh, significant, uh, both of those questions. Uh, uh, number one, the over policing of black community, it is pretty clear. Policing, the way it's conducted is to keep the black community on the reservation. They wanna keep you in that particular community and they police that community. And that happens. Now, there's reasons for it to some extent that's that's a larger problem than that. But obviously if crime is occurring in your neighborhood, then you then policing will take place. But the larger problem is what are the resources that go into that community? The police do not create that problem. Those are political questions that exact that, that occur in terms of the, the distribution of the resources, the public resource. As a consequence of not getting that, then the African American community in many ways is, is placed in a situation where they don't have resources, they don't have opportunity. Uh, and as a consequence, they have more crime. When you have more crime, then you have more police. So the police, and so the police are then there to keep you from going to the communities where people don't have crimes. And that, and I see that in my own community. I see that often. But I will tell you this: the question that you raised about the criminal justice system and the systematic racism. You know, you may know this, but you know, I was a former prosecutor in Chicago and in Alameda County and in criminal defense work for a period of time. The one thing that drove me totally insane that ultimately caused me to leave criminal defense work was the, the, the systematic racism that exists within the system. It's not anything that anybody talks about. You know, I mean, I don't think that the judges who are there necessarily are racist in terms of how they view things. I don't think necessarily think that all prosecutors are racist, although you know, I have my, my feeling about prosecutors and all. Uh, and I don't think the criminal defense lawyers are, are racist uh, for the most part. But I will tell you, there's like this the undercurrent of a system that exists, like it or not. I referred to when I was doing criminal defense line, and it wasn't my original thought, was the defendants were African Americans of the chow line. And everywhere you go along the way, people take a bite of, out of that. And ultimately, you go from, the, from, from being stopped in the street. Uh, arrested by the police, bail set, uh, uh, going before the court, getting their lawyers, and over a period of time that uh, you wind up going on a criminal justice system that in and of itself, without anybody being said, has the impact of racial disparities. And it's, you know, when you look at the data that I used to look at very closely before I left criminal defense work, is every step along the way. From, the, from police contact to going off to sentencing, African Americans are discriminated and treated and much treated much differently uh, than than whites in the judicial system. And it was the it was the most hurtful thing to me. I ultimately decided I had to leave because I was not controlling my own destiny. I was being controlled, you know, by all these other forces out here: the police, the DA, the judges, probation officer. All these folks were controlling my own destiny. And I didn't see that I was having an impact in any way. Sure, I could win a case. There's no doubt about that. I could win a case and that guy would go, that woman or girl would go off and go back to their lives. Sometimes they come back. But I ultimately concluded that if I really wanted to have be impactful in a, in a, as a lawyer, I needed to do something different. And because I always had a civil rights concept in my heart and in my mind, and that was an easy transition for me to make after a period of time. But the criminal justice system to me was so fundamentally um, um, had this racial bias inherent in it that I could not see myself participating in this process anymore. And I couldn't. And, uh, but you know, uh, that's part of the things you see within the system itself. Now, that's just one element of the world, <laughs> the criminal justice system, but that is a serious one because what you're really doing by putting people in the criminal justice system you are preventing them from earning an economic life, earning money, because now they become second-class citizens and their ability to get a job, a meaningful job is secondary to other, other folks. And I always thought that the war, and I've said this many years ago, the war on drugs was a war on the black community. It was to undermine the integrity of the black families. It was gonna cause people to be in economic deprivation. And it was all about what? What was it about? My view was a full employment for white men because that meant that they would get jobs that the black men could not get because they are now caught in the criminal justice system. At a time when 
at a time when the data was clear that, that the white community was using drugs at the same level, if not higher level than African American community. And then you had these draconian laws, particularly around cocaine and crack cocaine, where African American men, uh, people were being sentenced at a much higher, higher level. And, and there wasn't this issue around drug abuse like they have now when it's concerned. They were sending people to jail. When you send people to jail, the collateral damage is you ruin their family, you ruin them, they can never compete. And the only job they can get maybe is the, 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 the lowest level of the economic strata. And so to me, that's, that's kind of a system that's in place that's designed to do that. So when you talk about structural stuff, that's part of it, that there's no one there's no one guiding this per se, but the systems in place is guiding because what you're trying to do is you're trying to make sure that there's somebody at the bottom, if you will, who can carry out the local, the, 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 the low level jobs and or the jobs for those people like in prisons and all. And, and so those, those are disturbing matters in which I honestly, when I, those things went to the heart of my practice uh, for years, I was on this, you know, this trek of running around in different counties and part of the state fighting these battles and recognizing that wherever I went, wherever I went, no matter where, that there was this kind of racism that existed. And the further you got away from San Francisco and Alameda County, the worse it was. And as a consequence, there were counties that you go to that you just could not think you're going to get a fair trial. So I spent a lot of time in those early days fighting the system, fighting the judges fighting the DAs, fighting all these people, because I was curious about what I would see in terms of how they treated people and to get those individuals, whether it's the judges or the DAs, to look at my client as a personality, as a person, uh, like I had to get a judge to do the other day. You know, he didn't even see this kid. He just, the pro forma said, you do that, da, da, da. I said, well, there's no reason to put this kid on, on a, on a four-way search. He wasn't involved in any drugs or any crimes of any kind. It was a traffic matter. And so those are the kind of things you see. And, and I also know that I told the court, look, if you do that, you are like setting this kid up to be harassed by the police. And he is in the middle of a police case, right. We're not suing the police. So what do you think is gonna happen now? If the police know there's a four-way search clause on him, he'll get stopped and harassed all the time. Well, I wasn't gonna stand for that. And I didn't stand for that. But I used to be, in my younger days, I was a fighting devil all the time and I got held up threatened to be held in contempt often, but I never did, mainly because I was right. They didn't like my attitude about it, but I was right. And so that's part of what being a lawyer was uh, and is and as an advocate. So you talked a lot about the systematic racism uh, that you've witnessed and I've witnessed it too. And so the next question is, how do we fix it? There's some folks who suggest if we had more black judges, if we had more black prosecutors, if we just had more people of color involved in the system, somehow or another that would fix it. But we've seen many examples with just having a black face doesn't fix wow. systematic racism. So what are your thoughts on what we need to do to actually fix the system? Well, I haven't given a lot more thought to what I've said because um, I'm, I'm sort of focused in on trying to fix the issue that I'm involved in, which is the police issue. I think that the other issues in terms of just having black faces in and of itself is insufficient. That really doesn't solve the problem. Uh, it can be more sensitive. You know, I was a prosecutor, you know, and I was sensitive. You know, I, I thought I made a difference, but I don't, but I was, but the truth of the matter is I was probably able to do that much more so than younger prosecutors because I had come from Chicago and some experience and you know, you know, people gave me a lot more credit than probably I deserved. So I had a lot more flexibility. But younger prosecutors don't have that. There's a box that everybody gets put into in terms of decisions that are made. So I don't know that you can until you get really far up the, the ladder. But even then, but even then, there's a protocol that exists. So I don't know that it's a matter of having a black prosecutor or not. You know, we've seen that throughout. Um, that hasn't, doesn't make that much of a difference. It may be marginally different. Certainly in certain cases, I think you can, it can matter. But um, I don't see that as the issue. I, I see the greater issue is the, the, economic, um, the economic and political resources that are put into a particular community. If you don't put the money into a community, 
where, where, where kids and young people can, can dream about a future and have an opportunity to match those dreams, uh, it doesn't matter because all you're really doing is setting them up. Uh, the society is setting them up for failure. And there is a desire to have people in prison. You know, they have the desire to have people at the lower end of the economic stream. They'd rather for you to be the janitor than somebody else. They'd rather for you to be at the lower end. You know, this, that's, that's a process that, that exists. And, you know, and I've seen that and fought for all of that. But I recognize that you can't solve all the problems with one person. It has to be somebody else. Somebody has to see those as legitimate issues. But I firmly understand and know that the issue is not about lawyers per se. It, it isn't. Uh, you got to have, it's, 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 what are you doing to that first grader, that preschool kid? What are you doing for that kid so that that kid can have a sense of who, what, can, what his po possibilities are? And I'll give you an example, the one that I stick with me very, very closely. I represented a kid maybe 10, 15 years ago by the name of Willie Gilbert. Willie Gilbert was an African young boy who died at 18, but, but, he, but when he was four to six, he was a beautiful young black kid, just as beautiful as a six-year-old can be. And he had charisma. And so he got selected to do kind of uh, uh, you know, commercials, you know, for, for, for black kids. And he was a beautiful little black kid. And, and, and that sort of was his dream. He was living with his, his, his great-grandmother. His dad was in prison. His grandfather was in prison. His mother was, his mother, his mother was a crack addict. And the grandmother did not live much. So he had nothing there. Big mama was who, who ran their lives. But by the time this <coughs> kid was 10 or 12, he didn't have any vision about being whatever that was anymore. And by 13, he was like in the streets. He was, you know, being a runner for drug people. And at 14, he had a child. And at 7, 16, 17, he saw a shooting take place. At 18, he was dead. And I always, you know, it was hurtful to watch because there was a kid who was bright eyed and never had a chance. I had to represent him in a police case, but uh, you know, those are the kind of things you see all the time. And the question, who cares about those individuals? You know, who cares? You know? One of the most famous cases that you've been involved with is the Rodney King matter. And I still remember uh, the Rodney King case. I was a kid at the time. Uh, and uh, I remember seeing with my family these officers beating this black man, and even as a child being angry and frustrated and hurt. Uh, and then, of course, when the verdict came back, uh, where these officers, at least in the um, in the state case, uh, were found uh, not to be uh, liable, it, it just it just caused so much anger and frustration. And even though I didn't participate in any writing, I could understand. And I was actually living in Los Angeles. I saw the fires. I saw everything that happened where uh, that truck driver, Reginald Denny, was beaten, was actually just a few steps away from the barbershop my family had been going to for, for decades. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about your involvement with uh, the Rodney King case and also just the, the impact that it had uh, on the black community. Well, certainly I remember watching Rodney King beating when it first happened uh, on the TV stage up here in uh, the KTVU. At that point in time, I had already done a lot of police misconduct cases. So I was kind of well known about those cases. So, but Rodney King, Milton Grimes asked me to help him do this case at the time. Uh, he was more of a criminal defense lawyer. I was just more of a police person. So we teamed up. The case was um, dramatic in the sense that you had Rodney King, who people, even despite all that we saw on the video streams, there were not people who were supportive of him. You know, the vast majority of white people did not support Rodney King, and they, they thought it was well, that it was deserved. And at the end of the day, as I was dealing the case, it was like, you got a lot of nerve suing the police on behalf of this. You know, we need the police to be uh, protected and not. And, and so for me, that was an eye opener. And I had been involved, you see my resume, in a case way before that called Melvin Black, which was a 14 year old black kid who had been shot and killed by the police. And even though there was a public outcry initially uh, uh, from the community, at the end of the day, people did not want to challenge the police. And, and so I understood that. And so 
by then I had been doing a lot of cases uh, suing the police. And so it was pretty clear to me that these are very difficult cases that people support the police. Rodney King really was the first time the vast majority of white people that video had a chance to see how African-Americans were treated by the police. And even with that, they didn't believe it. They just believed it was caused, Rodney King caused his own problem. And, and for regard to his failure to comply. And when I did the case, it was, it was a very challenging case to get people to appreciate that notwithstanding who he was and beforehand, the constitution protected him against this level of conduct. And so it was, we won the case pretty easily. And for, from a personal point of view, obviously it was a great case for me to do, uh, and which I enjoyed, but it also taught me something else that a case presents an opportunity, a case can't present an opportunity for public reform because you can make the case bigger than the four corners of the case. And so in the Rodney King case, the, the police, the Christopher Commission came out of that and they did a lot of efforts in trying to reform the LAPD at the time. But what I remember about it and what impacted me was, oh, you can take a case and you can use that case to move a, a, to a greater, bigger social agenda. And if you see in my practice, I did that after that. I mean, I did that in a number of cases and I was very much pleased with the notion that a case can be more, uh, more than the case, more than the money, more than what you get. You can, you can actually change the conditions that exist by, by, by the case itself. That's one beauty of having a lawyer and a lawsuit itself the lawsuit itself becomes the basis upon which you can then use uh, to serve to uh, bring about change. And so I, my first case like that when I came back from LA was um, uh, uh, Nathaniel Watkins. Nathaniel Watkins was a dog bite case. He was a notorious burglar, you know, drug abuse guy. And he's, in the, he's doing all kinds of bad things. And uh, he gets caught in, a, in an attic and uh, he gets um, chewed up by the police, the police dogs. And he was telling them, I'm, you know, I give up, I give up, I give up, but the dogs were chewing him up. Well, what we were able to do with that case was to change the dog bite policy from fine and, and bite to find and bark. And that policy has saved a great number of people, at least in OPD. We don't have, we, I haven't had a dog bite case since. That's been almost 30 years. And that was a change, a subtle change, but it's what you can do. And Nathaniel Watkins was just an ordinary dude. He was, Nathaniel Watkins was, you know, a burglar, a drug, drug uh, abused person. And so he's obviously using drugs to satisfy himself, uh, to, protect, uh, to heal himself. But the case itself was very helpful in that sense. So that became my impetus as I moved forward from, from Rodney King to see that you can use cases uh, to bring about significant social change. And of course, that led me into the writer's case. Uh, where that I had just finished a book deal uh, in 1999, Blue versus Black, but then the conflict between cops and minorities, where I really had talked about what you can do, what can be done in, um, in terms of policing. Now, it might have been a little naive on my part at the time, but I certainly had this vision that we can change the culture of a department, we can deal with internal affairs, we can stop the shootings, and certainly the racial profiling kind of things that I was very concerned. So lo and behold, this case falls into my lap, if you will, uh, in 2000, commonly referred to as the Riders case. And that really was four men, uh, four police officers who were basically riding around as vigilantes uh, in the uh, Oakland, uh, West Oakland, um, you know, attacking people. And basically, it had the sanction in many ways of the police chief and or the, of the, of the mayor. And what they were trying to do was cut down on crime. And, and so what they, these people were doing, and this was a drug ep epidemic that was going on. So these officers were stopping people, trying to get information from them, you know, planting drugs on them, if not that, beating them up. And then and the worst part about it is they were, was that they were stopping people, trying to get information. The person didn't have anything. They would take them to jail and they would put a, a, put a little one rock, one little rock on them and charged them with possession of drugs. And so we represented over 100 people in that regard. It probably was many more folks. It went on for a number of years. 
But more importantly for me, I understood at the very beginning when I got this case, this is, quote, this is the one. And I knew starting out that I was going to use this case as a case to bring about reform. Jim Channon, who was a uh, colleague of mine, who also had a couple of cases, and we had done some cases together. We started, we looked up and we brought this case. We brought about four or five cases. And, um, but the company referred to as the writer's case and writers. And so we represented almost 120 people. But those weren't the issue. These were, these were sad commentary people. They, many of these folks are going to jail. Not one person in high school diploma that I remember. You know, these, these are people who, who, as I talked to you earlier about what happens to you when the dream is not fulfilled, well, you do grow up, right? <laughs> you do grow up. And when you grow up, what happens to you is this. You know, most of these people wind up going to state prison for a little crime. None of them had real employment opportunities that earned any skills, and they were on the margins. And, and so we were able to get a significant amount of money for them. But that wasn't what I was about in this case. I was about the reform. So it really gave us an opportunity to take the Oakland Police Department really under a microscope and look at it. And, and we did that. We had about 55 tasks that we worked out and saw a negotiated settlement agreement. We had a federal monitor that was going to ensure that what we did, that what they did was correct. We had a federal judge who was going to oversee all of us. And I stayed involved. And this is a situation where me and Shannon actually had a, temp, a chance to rewrite the policies. Wow. We really had a chance to look at the, the, within the bowels of the department and see what was going on there. And we did. We, over a two or three year period, we wrote, we wrote uh, many of the, uh, the general orders and policies that existed and put together a number of tasks that had to be completed. The ar argument was that you complete these tasks during this five year period. And then uh, when it's done, you have one year of sustainability and the case will be over. Unfortunately, <laughs> we have not completed that task. And, and the big issues that I was concerned about uh, were still present. Racial profiling was a huge issue for me. That meant to me that we were stopping black people, black men in particular, you're stopping them. You don't have probable cause or reasonable suspicion and you're stopping them and you put them in a criminal justice. Well, that has to stop and no. The issue then becomes this point. How do you know that's true? That's versus you, okay? That's, that's my view. That's, what, that's an empirical view of all these years I've been doing the work. So one of the things we decided to do, let's do, a, let's, do a, let's do a stop data gathering process. We're gonna put together a system where everybody that's stopped by OPD has to fill out a card. And that card, you have to put in the name of the person, the race of the person, the basis of the stop, et cetera, et cetera. It became stop data. The purpose was to look to see over a period of time why these people were stopped and can we see any systematic issues that, such as people being stopped, you know, race, without a basis, a legitimate basis for it. And, and so the problem on it, and, and also looking at internal affairs, my big issue was internal affairs investigations because, you know, I recognize when people go into the system you know, and, and the investigation is only for the police. Well, then that person made that complaint becomes vulnerable to the police at some later point. And, and so that was a huge, huge issue. And then we had issues about if you want to file a complaint, can you do it? Uh, ultimately, when it came out of all this, that I became very much conscious of, aside from that, with racial disparities in police department itself as it relates to police officers, I had a view that Black officers were being discriminated against and that more complaints were being filed against them and they're being disciplined at a much higher rate than the white officers. Well, you know, so I called the study to take place. And in the course of that, we did find that some of that was in fact true. And, and now we had brought in Stanford to help us analyze a lot of the data. And so we were able to make real findings about the, uh, about the, uh, the uh, racial profiling type activities that I referred to. And then you can see that African-Americans were being stopped at a much, much higher rate than other officers. Uh, and other, as other people in the community. And this is a big deal. So we spent, we spent 15 years trying to get those numbers down. Well, we, we didn't get the real numbers in 20, 2014 because initially the police did not try to um, satisfy the terms and conditions of the NSA, the agreement. They just, they must have thought that we were just going to go away. And it is true, this was a very unusual situation. We have not had throughout the country, we have not seen any, any place where private lawyers themselves had brought this type of an agreement to head. And so there we were. 
uh, Jim and I working on this, um, and we've been working on it for years and years and years, but it's really the police department had responsibility to do stuff. I think, you know, there's some discussion about is it ever going to get done. I'm hopeful it does. My kids have grown up since I've been on this particular case, and we still have been uh, uh, working uh, on it uh, with the monitor and everyone else. So it's been, it's been a positive statement, but it's been very hard work, and we haven't completed it, but I'm hopeful that we will. Now, we've had, we've had six to eight police chiefs, right, three right. Mayors, four mayors, you know, uh, mayors, and four or five mayors. So we've had a, this transition of political people, and you can't do this work successfully uh, from a monitoring point of view without the full commitment of the political leaders of the town. We've had all these, uh, we've had all these different mayors who have different points of view, city managers with different points of views about it. And then we've had police chiefs with different commitments and, and uh, the level. And so we've had, we haven't had a continuity of leadership that would have helped get this done sooner. Now we've been involved in this case now on the, on the, on the, on the consent side for almost 17 years. It's just phenomenal. On the other hand, the department is a whole lot better than what? I mean, we don't, you know, they had a recent study out uh, by a group that shows that Oakland's police shootings are, are, are the best in terms of the lowest numbers of cities over 400,000. 400, uh, racial profiling things have changed considerably. We have fewer people being stopped. The problem that we haven't dealt with, though, is the per capita, because it seems to me that we've, they've gone to different forms of policing, which we still have, even though the numbers have come down, they're still the same ratio. That doesn't make any sense to me. So we're still working through that. But, but to put the truth of the matter is we have fewer people stopped. We have fewer people being shot and killed. We have fewer people being beaten up. And those are, those are very positive points from my point. Can you talk? Well, thank you so much, John. We're reaching the end of our uh, interview, but I just wanna give you a chance to give any final thoughts before we uh, wrap up here uh, about where we should go from here. Well, I think that, you know, in, in, in moving forward, it's extraordinarily important that we have commitment, both from a, from a legal point of view, lawyers who are willing to fight these um, battles and move the agenda forward, but also the community itself. I do think that protesting uh, and people self-righteously are protesting about mistreatment and are appearing before councils and appearing before the public body uh, are important. It takes all of us working together. It doesn't have to be just me or just you. It's a collective human race and the community, people of like mind. Because you never, as W.A. Du Bois would say, with talent and ten, they have to take care of the other 90%. And so those of us with the ability and the time and commitment really are those who have to have, keep pushing forward, asking for the questions, you know, asking for it and, and, and moving things forward uh, in a positive way. And it can be done. Well, John, thank you so much uh, for taking time to, to share this knowledge and wisdom with us. We appreciate it. And also thank you for your service to the community. And thanks to all the attendees for participating in this year's annual meeting. Uh, we hope that you enjoy the rest of the meeting. Thanks again, everyone. Take care.